Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today we're joined by Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon Digital. This podcast was produced in person at the recent Jackson Hole Ski Summit, so there's some ambiance and background noise in the show. Thanks to Amanda Cavallari for help in making these shows possible. Today we discuss Marathon Digital's playbook, including its relationship with Applied Digital, after the Compute North bankruptcy, movement into the UAE, S19 XP purchases, and increasing miner efficiency under its hosted model. Fred, welcome to the Mining Pod. We are in warm, sunny Jackson Hole. Just kidding. We're inside uh, in the basement of a hostel recording this. Got a little ambiance going on, which is great. We're going to talk about Marathon Digital, uh, one of the largest publicly listed Bitcoin miners out there. A pleasure to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, you just finished up a panel, and a lot of it was about strategy. Unfortunately, as we said before we were recording here, I did not get to attend because I was doing another podcast. But we can go through it here now, talk about strategy. Um, we are waiting on Marathon to produce its Q4 numbers, which uh, I wish we could get them on this podcast, but another day we'll get them. Uh, looking forward to those numbers. But let's talk about strategy and and talk about some recent headlines. So to kick off the conversation, you guys are now moving to, towards mining in the Middle East. You guys have worked with Applied Digital to secure hosting in the U.S. You're continuing your guidance for 23 exahash in the U.S., continuing that hosting model. Uh, you sold a little Bitcoin recently, but mostly hodling, second largest hodl of any public company to my knowledge. So a lot of talking points there, but all that derives from a strategy that you and your team are working on. Um, I'd love to hear just a high level explanation of that, and then we can get into like the individual bits. Sure. So we've spent the past um, year kind of setting up our execution for this year, uh, which is obviously building out and deploying the full 23 exahash by mid this year, and we're well on our way. Um, February production report shows us having made great progress there, and uh, March will be a great month as well with a lot more progress there. We have a lot of miners racked and ready to energize, and the energization is now starting. So we're feeling very bullish about that. Yeah, you know, we're very focused on energizing and optimizing. And part of optimizing is also taking the full technology stack. And similar to the Apple iPhone in the Apple ecosystem, Apple can do very unique things with their phones because they not only own access to the ASICs, but they own the operating system in the phone, they own part of the stuff at the carrier level, they own the whole ecosystem around apps, et cetera. And so we've taken a technology approach to our strategy and said, you know, if we're going to really be very successful here, we need to be able to control our miners from top to bottom. And so what does that mean? Well, we run our own pool and by operating our own pool, it means we don't have to essentially optimized to the lowest common denominator across a bunch of different miners with different fleets. We have a pretty homogenous fleet. It's either X19J Pros or X19 XPs. And by mid this year, our fleet will be 60, our hash rate will be 66% XPs. So 30% more efficient than the J Pros uh, and the most efficient miners commercially available today. If you look at our fleet composition, overall our efficiency, you know, across the board will be about an average of 25 joules per terahash, where the average mining fleet out there today is in the 45 range. So very efficient fleet um, in that regard. So we also, with the learnings from kind of the third-party hosting model, have figured out that we want to have more and more control over the actual operation. And so we spent the last year developing a strategy around owned and operated, more vertically up integrated. And the deal we've done in the UAE is the first kind of manifestation of that. Uh, we designed that full system. You know, we're obviously controlling the build on it and uh, defining how it's going to be operated. And again, because we control the whole stack now, uh, you know, we have our own firmware running in the miners. We have our own controllers running miners. We have our own pool running. We have full end-to-end -end control and eventually control all the way down to the ASIC. And what that does is lets us really tweak and optimize production. The UAE site is um, an immersion site. Uh, we ran the pilot site for that, and it was 110 days before an engineer had to go do anything at the site. And let's just say we overclocked XPs a lot faster than anybody ever expected. And I'm not going to give you the number, <laughs> but it was a lot faster than anybody expected. And so when you combine the fact that an engineer didn't have to touch anything, and we can manage it totally remotely because of the software stack that we've built. 
you know, we had the benefit of, you know, 2022 was a tough year, but we spent that year investing in technology and we're now seeing the fruition of that. So that site in UAE, it'll be 250 megawatts when it's fully built, the largest data center in the Middle East. Um, and so we're super excited about that. And, you know, that'll be online by the end of this year. It's an 80-20 joint venture. So we, we don't get the full benefit of that hash rate. We get 20% of the benefit. But that's additional to the 23x hash we're deploying here in the U.S. So we have about 7x hash running at King Mountain in West Texas. Uh, we've since turned on about an additional little over 2x hash in the month of February. Uh, on top of that, we have a lot more coming online with Applied Digital uh, in March through July, uh, which we're super excited about. And all of that Applied Digital hash rate is XP's. So we're super excited to see those start really contributing to, uh, to our hash rate. But as we look forward, you know, our model is more really about us partnering with energy companies and then designing, building, and operating sites ourselves. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities out there today to find access to power. There are a lot of people who built height sites either to do third-party hosting, offer third-party hosting, or for self-mining who don't have the capital to build it out. And so you've got a transformer, you've got a substation, you've got some basic infrastructure, and they just haven't done any more. So we'll look at um, some of those types of opportunities and uh, leveraging the design we built for UAE and replicating that domestically. And we think, again, with the success we've had at the pilot site uh, in the Middle East, if we can replicate that in the U.S., like in Texas, um, and we manage our power pricing properly with hedging, et cetera, we think it's going to be a huge game changer for us. So we're super excited about the balance of this year and you know, into the having. You know, a follow-on logical question is, well, what are we going to do beyond that 23 exahash? Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll have to see. We're adding, you know, we're tripling our capacity by mid-year compared to where we were at the end of last year. The halving happens in May of next year. It's really dependent on what happens with the price of Bitcoin, right? If Bitcoin stays under 40K by the halving, that's kind of the equivalent of 20K today. There are going to be a lot of miners that are going to have a struggling time uh, that will struggle in 2024 beyond the halving. And typically, Bitcoin price, if you follow historical patterns, doesn't really start ramping until a few months after the halving and then tends to peak kind of six to 12 months after the halving. Yeah. Um, not sure that that'll replicate, but if Bitcoin price remains subdued and uh, you know there's not a lot of free excess capital floating around the world right now, so there's a high likelihood that, that may happen, we believe there'll be a lot of consolidation opportunities come next year. Mm. And so we've been very focused on building a lot of cash on our balance sheet uh, deleveraging our debt and putting ourselves in a position where we have lots of optionality, which if you've heard me speak before, optionality is kind of how I like to run a business. And so we'll have the ability to either go buy machines that are cheap or go buy sites, uh, acquire somebody if it makes sense. Haven't yet come across a deal that makes sense because, you know, one of the di unique dynamics in this business is that machine prices get cheaper, the lower Bitcoin price becomes. And so if you're going to acquire somebody, you could just go buy new machines for the same price. So. Mm. So lots of different things we could pull on from that. I want to go back to the hosting model, which for those listening are where that Compass runs this podcast and has also been the mire with uh, the hosting model. Hosting model was pushed to its limits for the last two years. Uh, large deployments, lots of different contracts in people's hands, and those contracts did not always play out in people's favors. Compute North is probably the poster child of that. I mean, we don't really need to go into detail there too much, but... Now that they're in Chapter 11 uh, and all their contracts have been bought at auction from other people, the question becomes, should people be pursuing that model again? Or should you just build your own infrastructure? I tend to agree that like hosting can 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 continue just about building correct relationships. Uh, but you guys seem to agree with that as well. Applied Digital is something you guys work with uh, extensively, especially North Dakota. Want to get your thoughts on the hosting model. So yeah, that's just like the, the gist of the question. Where is hosting for you guys? How do you guys view it? And how does it view? How is it viewed in your strategy for 2023, 2024? Sure. So um, as I was talking about the strategy, you know, when we design and operate our own sites, that kind of obviates the need for having a third party do it. You know, unless somebody can do it better than we can, and we're more than happy to learn from people and partner with people who did, can do it better. But as long as we think we can do it better then what we're really interested in is people who are interested in developing sites. And then we'll 
partner with them to develop a site and we'll own, build and operate our own part of that site. Um, but there's a whole power component that you know, we don't do, obviously. Um, I think the third party hosting model it works for miners of a certain scale, right? It, it, you know, it takes a lot of capital to build a site. It takes a lot of capital to operate a site. And, um, you know, if you're not talking about tens of exahash, you know, the third party hosting model is still very attractive. Now I think it's changing where before, if you go back to like 2021, it was all about fixed price deals and it was kind of, you had a fixed price on the energy and there was a fixed markup for the hosting and that was your nut. And, you know, that model got companies like core into trouble because they had variable pricing on their input cost of the energy. Um, but they were selling at a fixed price to their customers. And so a lot of the third party hosters now were saying, Hey, you know, we'll basically charge you a fixed fee per machine for hosting operations. And then it's passed through power and either you can let, you know, the hosting company do the hedging and do all that, or you can do it yourself. At that point, all the risk is on the miner. It's not on the hosting partner. Mm -hmm. The only risk that's on the hosting partner is the raising the capital to build the site and then, uh, you know, obviously operating it. So I think the model's changing and that's creating even more of an incentive for companies of even medium scale to start operating their own sites. Now it starts coming down to, can you get power pricing that's appropriate, you know, attractive? Can you hedge? Do you have the financial wherewithal to do that? And not all companies have the balance sheet to do that. We're lucky in that we have a very strong balance sheet and can do that. But so that's, I think, an area where the folks that are in the third party hosting business, meaning the service providers, uh, it's going to be a tough couple of years for them. You know, um, Jason Les was on the panel with me today here and, you know, their model, uh, with Corsicana is kind of, you know, a blend of self mining and, uh, third party hosting. And the question is, you know, there's not a lot of demand for the third party hosting. So I think, uh, you know, companies who follow that traditional model, uh, are going to have some challenges and they'll just have to do more self mining, which, you know, I think is good for the industry at the end of the day. But uh, yeah, I think the third party hosting model, you know, it can work small sites, uh, smaller volumes of miners, but the bigger you get, the more you need to vertically integrate. Yeah. Not to mention the, the lawsuits that spring up from third party hosting. Uh, yeah, we won't mention any of those, but they are, there's a lot in the industry right now. Let's talk about the other side of that facility model and talk about the play in the UAE, um, with AGGM. You said that that is to be past that 23 exa hash guidance. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is exciting. At the same time, a lot of people are looking at you guys sort of being the first big mega miner to step into the Middle East, uh, to my knowledge at least, and they're like, oh, this is kind of far out on a limb. Um, what do you guys think about that in terms of like, what was the impetus or motivation to move out of the United States, uh, out of North America really, and start mining uh, in a very different jurisdiction with different political uh, ideologies, different political ways of doing things, different power structures, contracts. There's so much knowledge you guys have to build up again just to be able to operate there. So, yeah, great question. So, um, you know, Bitcoin miners always focus on finding the lowest cost energy and consistent supply. In the Gulf region, you have a huge climate asymmetry, right? You have winters that are cool and you have summers that are extremely hot. And so you have to have power generation enough to support all the air conditioning you need in the summertime, which in the case of UAE is somewhere around four gigawatts of energy. Um, and in the case of their winter time, they only use about one gigawatt. So you've got this huge swing. So there's a lot of stranded energy. You've got another dynamic there, which is um, they need the heat offtake from their energy generation to run their water desalination because they don't have wells. They have to desalinate water from the Gulf and turn it into fresh water to drinking water. So they still have to run part of that infrastructure uh, to generate heat. And so in addition to that, uh, you know, in some countries there, the government subsidizes electricity to their consumers. So they're kind of, you know, getting a, they have issues on all sides of it. So um, the ideal play kind of in that region is if you can take that excess energy, that stranded energy and consume it, generate some revenue for the energy producer so they can maybe decrease their subsidies or help fund more water desal, whatever they're going to do with it, then it's a very symbiotic relationship. Uh, the advantage you have in that region is often the government controls energy generation, energy distribution. They also control the rules and laws. Could be risky as well. The benefit with UAE is 
they have this construct around the ADGM, which is essentially the Abu Dhabi Global Markets, which is a international trade zone that operates under English law, not local UAE law. And so uh, foreign companies like Marathon have the benefit of having a more, uh, a set of law that's going to, uh, for commercial purposes, that is more easily understandable by both our lawyers and by courts. And um, it's a very unique thing. And this is only unique in UAE, which makes it very attractive. It doesn't really exist in other Gulf states. And at the same time, obviously, um, you know, the UAE is a very wealthy nation. They have a, a sovereign wealth funds and, and deep pockets which to invest. And so it was the ideal place to kind of try and find a partnership with um, an entity that was willing to co-invest with us. And yeah, we're a minority partner. So it's really us providing technical expertise and knowledge and being able to build this site. And uh, it's been a great experience so far for us. And we're really excited about, you know, the site coming online later this year. So this is going to be somewhat of an ignorant question because I'm not aware of that region's power market too much, but I would assume that it's mostly natural gas is powering a lot of these applications. Is that more or less correct? Or? Yeah. So the traditional source of energy in um, Abu Dhabi has been natural gas, um, but they recently commissioned a five gigawatt nuclear plant, which is green energy. And um, as you may or may not be aware, the um, I believe it's the president of UAE is the chair for the COP28 for whatever the, the time period that yeah. lasts. It's a year or two years or whatever. So they're doing a big, uh, the next COP28 conference will be in UAE. And so um, they're very focused on green energy. And so essentially they, their whole, yeah, the, the government in UAE is very focused on doing everything uh, around green energy. They want to do, you know, green steel, all sorts of green things. So uh, essentially, you know, we will either fully offset um, any fossil fuel component from this, uh, mm -hmm. or it'll be sourced from nuclear, one of the two. And that was a, a reason or a motivational factor to move into that region was the green energy sources. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, our, our model is, you know, and we've stated we want to be carbon neutral in what we're doing. And, you know, that's why we site behind the meter at like wind farms in Texas and North Dakota. Um, it's sort of, our focus is really trying to be as much behind the meter at renewable. And in this case, it's, uh, you know, it'll either be nuclear or fully offset. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, let's move over to S19 XPs and talk about that again. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you guys are moving towards XPs for a stated reason, which is the efficiency gains. Uh, the tidbit about the overclocking, that was news to me. Most people I've been talking to have had a very difficult time cracking into those machines. Um, so if we can get more information, I'd be keen to get that out of you. Um, but yeah, I would be curious to get more thoughts on the S19 XP series and the reason for purchasing them. Because some people are looking at it and saying, like, the initial capital you're deploying to get those machines is not worth the efficiency gains over a stated period. And that's notably Zach from CleanSpark is one who says, like, hey, don't get the XPs. We're going to hold off. They have purchased some, to be fair. But uh, some people are pushing back on that a little bit because it's just the initial capital is high. What's your thoughts on the MIA economics with these units? Well, it's all dependent on what your cost of energy is, right? Mm -hmm. If you're paying more than four cents a kilowatt hour come to having S19J pros aren't going to be very profitable. Uh, so, you know, you can either decide to not mine yeah. or mine at a loss, or you can mine at least be making some money. And, you know, what a lot of people don't think about who are not in the industry is it isn't about what's happening in the next year. It's we're constantly looking at kind of four to five year deployment cycles. So when you buy miners and you deploy them, you're basically either contracting for four or five years of hosting and you're expecting four or five years of economic life out of the miner. And so in that four or five years, you'll go through at least one halving, at least one winter, and at least one boom period. And so if you are only profitable from the spring through the autumn and the rest of the year you're unprofitable, you're never going to get a payback on those miners no matter how inexpensive they were. And, you know, when we bought the XPs, we placed the order at the peak of the market, but we placed an order with price protection. So, you know, we didn't pay $85 a terahash for them in the end. Uh, it was a lot less than that, obviously. So, um, you know, we believe that you always have to be at the bleeding edge of the efficiency curve, uh, especially when it's not a number go up market. And, you know, we're definitely not in a number go up environment, at least not for the next few years. Uh, same topic slightly different immersion. We've been waiting on Argo and 
Riot to give us some information about their immersion setups, but information has been very sparse. You guys have a stated intention to dip or dunk a lot of these ASICs and get more immersion benefits out of them. Any updates on how that's been going so far, given that the immersion market is so difficult to work in, there's so many different people trying to build these things and it's been been fairly difficult. Sure. So like I mentioned earlier, you know, the UAE site is immersion. It's single phase. And you know, the pilot ran without human intervention for over 100 days and with significant overclock. And so why can we do that? Well, again, we control the full tech stack from the pool all the way down to the firmware in the miner mm-hmm. and the controller mm-hmm. in the miner. Um, if you were to ask me the follow-on question, which is where do we think immersion's going? Yeah. We're big believers uh, in the fact that Single phase immersion is good, but first gen single phase immersion is not efficient. You have to use second or third gen, and what we've deployed in, in the UAE is second and will be third gen as well over the life of that because the initial deployment will likely be uh, gen two, and then by the time we do the balance, it'll be gen three uh, on that immersion tech. But we believe that dual phase immersion uh, is where it's really going to be longer term. Benefit with dual phase immersion, um, while uh, it today can cost a little bit more from a mm-hmm. CapEx perspective. It allows you even better hands-off operation of miners. And um, I think the bigger change, whether it's single phase or dual phase, is we're going to go from shoebox miners to blade-based miners, which are built for immersion. You know, the problem in an immersion tank today is because of the physical space the metal enclosures of miners take, there's a lot yep. of wasted volume, right? So if you instead went to a blade server model with a black back a black bad 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 sorry a back plane where you have uh, blades plugged in, uh, you can get up to four times the density of hash rate in the same physical space. Uh, and if you can do that properly, then now you can start building really compact data centers. And if you can if you can operate those very hands off, you now don't have to work at 100 megawatt scale. You yeah. can go down to 5 megawatt scale. And when you go down to 5 megawatt scale, you can start doing things like methane flare gas. You can start using landfill. Mm-hmm. You can start using small hydro sites. You can start using true stranded energy that has no place to go. And that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. And when that technology trickles down to the medium and small miners to buy then all of a sudden they're actually at a competitive advantage to the yeah. big miners. And so I think that will reinvigorate the kind of mom and pop and the small scale miners because you'll be able to go and contract for a flare at a oil field somewhere, mm-hmm. get a gen rack, and then deploy one of these you know immersion blade based systems and run it and go out and check it once every two weeks. And you know, otherwise you're getting telemetry over your you know, your IoT system. Definitely. Well while we're on the subject of efficiency gains I want to talk about the the stack that you guys use, and this is somewhat returning to the earlier part of the conversation, but same with efficiency here. You guys often uh, are working with hosting providers and then flying out techs if need be, but for the most part, you're leaning on the hosting providers to provide service. The issue with that is often that that person doesn't have incentives aligned or they don't have the training. Most people have dealt with this at this point. How do you guys approach that? Um, seems to be a tech solution on one hand, but noting that tech can't solve everything, how do you guys get to a point where you have the same or greater efficiencies than other uh, Bitcoin miners in the space? Noting that you guys already have like very leading efficiencies. So you know, one of the things we do is we work very closely. Uh, so for example, in our King Mountain site, we're now that USBTC is taking, or HUT 8 USBTC, whatever the name is going to be. <laughs> I think it's new HUT. I think it's a... an, or HUT Corp, HUT 8 Corp. Um, <laughs> So we work very closer, closely with the um, USBTC team in kind of showing them, here's how we want you to run the site. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a lot of great skills in power management, energy purchasing, and stuff like that, uh, curtailment technology. So it's this very symbiotic relationship where we're learning from them, they're learning from us. Yeah. Um, you know, we have uh, built our own repair center, centralized repair center. We deploy remote repair centers at all the sites. So we're able to service our own miners uh, more efficiently. And, you know, especially with the, uh, in the relationship with Applied Digital there, we've had more influence on the design of some of the, uh, of how those miners are uh, operated. And going forward, you know, we'll obviously have a lot more control over that. So again, it's kind of, for us, we're growing out of the third party Mm -hmm. hosting model uh, as we've kind of reached adulthood, if you would. 
uh, and uh, taking the training wheels off, if you would. But uh, we're super excited about the future and, and, and what we're doing. And, you know, we love how the industry is maturing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the, the challenge going forward for a lot of miners is going to be more about just having to be much more sophisticated in how they manage finances and how yeah. they manage, you know, their growth. And it's not just number go up or, you know, and grow at all costs because, you know, that model just doesn't work. Well, speaking of USBTC and HUD-8, uh, you guys are working with USBTC at that King Mountain site, and HUD-8 and them just merged. HUD-8 is naturally a competitor, is also a public miner. Do you see any potential issues there or any bottlenecks in a potential merger between the two companies uh, with Marathon, or how do you see that evolving? No, I mean, I, I joke with Jamie Leviton that HUD-8, who I've you know known for a few years and respect very much, uh, that I'm now your customer, so you better be nice to me for once. Um, but no, I think it's, it's a very collegial mm -hmm. relationship. I mean, I have very good relationships with the guys at Core, the guys at Riot, you know, everybody. I think we all have to. This is an industry where, you know, while we're all competing for, ha for you know, our fair share of the global hash rate, yeah. um, we're also all fighting external forces like regulatory environments, energy policy, things like that. And we all have to work together and be able to work together. And there's definitely um, synergies in, in, you know, leveraging the best of uh, breed in you know, different companies uh, for all miners to succeed. So, Love that. Okay, last question for you as we close out here. What are some forward-looking things you guys are looking to do or things that you're going to see in the mining market this year? And prelude to that question is 2022, you guys invest in the tech and now you guys are we're reaping the benefits of that. From 2023 into 2024, what are some things that you guys are thinking about from a strategy perspective? Um, so as I mentioned a little earlier, I think the price of Bitcoin is going to drive a lot of the decisions. So we kind of operate um, three plans at all times, bear model, base case, bull case, right? And there are three very distinct plans and we maintain the optionality um, to be able to execute on that. So what does that mean? Well, A, we have to have the balance sheet that lets us react depending on what's going on. In a bear market case, uh, you know, right now our goal is just to get deployed um, so we can harvest between now and the halving mm -hmm. as much as we possibly can. The question is, you know, will the, will machine prices, um, where will machine prices be between now and the end of the year based on the price of Bitcoin? Because that'll drive 2024 growth. It also, uh, you know, you also have to have a look at kind of where energy prices are going. So, we're, you know, we have these very complex models. We have a strategy team that are constantly kind of crunching, trying to figure out exactly what strategy is ranking highest of the three options uh, at any given day. But I think essentially, and this is kind of beyond 2024, I think you're going to see us um, dabble in um, other types of renewable energy than just solar and wind. Uh, but you'll see us partnering more and more with developers of solar and wind or owners of sites. Again, continuing the behind the meter philosophy. Um, but really working on joint economics. Um, when you partner in the ownership of sites, um, it gives you a couple of advantages, uh, the most interesting of which is you get to share in the incentives the government pays these companies to build these sites. And our single biggest input cost is energy. So if you can find a way to subsidize your energy cost, mm -hmm. you have a competitive advantage because yeah. it means you can mine when other people can't if the price of Bitcoin drops. And we focus more on being able to operate in the downside cases because the upside's easy, just grow. Yeah. That's an easy yeah. strategy. It's in the downside that it's hard. And so we spend a lot of time analyzing and thinking about how do we protect ourselves in the downside? And is there a way to get to zero cost energy? Because if energy doesn't cost you anything, you can mine and grow as much as you want. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, Fred, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Appreciate your insights and hopefully speak again with you soon. Thank you. Really appreciate it.